I was recently asked how to be creative by a friend of mine who was apparently under the delusion that it's never something I struggle with. Which, of course, prompted me to spend a potentially alarming stretch of time confronting the existential dread that is trying to figure that out. Because ideas are, like, super trippy, right? They're like... Well, they're like belly button lint, because I find them all the time, but I don't actually know where they come from. I mean, sometimes I look at stuff I wrote a year ago and think, Wow, that was great. What if I never come up with something that good ever again, and I'm depleting a finite supply from beyond the veil, and I'm soon to fall to the Winter Court, becoming essentially an automaton with a hopefully sort of pretty face, oh god! <laughs> and if you aren't already in the habit of finding those ideas, then where do you start? What we're essentially looking for is a way to brute force creativity. When I was learning to draw, the way to improve wasn't exactly a secret. Sure, being the impatient ass that I was, I looked for every single way I could to accelerate the process, but when those ways turned out to be draw a sphere on a table 40 times instead of the 100 plus character cast of a web serial you're obsessed with, I figured it wasn't worth it. The point is, whether it's drawing or voice acting or Minecraft 1.9 PvP, the answer to getting better is just to do it. Look at what you did and try again. So today we are going to try and find something that can act as that basic unit of creativity. The sit-up, the multiplication table you were drilled with to the point of seething rage, the parkour roll, the naked person you're supposed to draw in 30 seconds, whatever. And to that end, we're going to set up a controlled environment and examine the nature of idea from a neurological perspective. To try these fun experiments at home, just assemble these normal household objects. Dish soap, a cardboard box, a refrigerator calendar, 10 years worth of box tops you have kicking around for no good reason, a glass of water, an electron microscope, pastafarian religious headwear, three cadavers, and your sense of wonder. Nah, I'm just messing with you. I ain't no Bill Nye the science guy, I'm Jay Maniac, your magic dealer from the far off lands of Magic Land. After all, what's more magical than Imagination? Get, get it? Cause like, Imagination, Magic Land, I'm from Magic Land. This is why my scripts are 11 pages long. And so whereas before your creativity was a soft magic system operating on its own whims, whistling about and speaking through you without comprehension or command, let us make of it a set of ridiculous rules through which to bludgeon thy frigid foes. Boredom, years of public school trauma, and people not paying enough attention to you. Wait, shit, is that where my complex comes from? Well, we're gonna just save that breakthrough for later. And if we're making a magic system, then of course we need to take a look at the Sanderson Laws of Magic. If you've never heard of Laws of Magic, you must be new here. Welcome to the channel. If I had a dollar for every time I failed to mention Sanderson's Laws of Magic in a video, I'd only have slightly more money than I make from these videos. Brando Sando can probably explain them better than I can, but basically we're looking at a set of guidelines for writing narratively satisfying magic in your fantasy stories. If you aren't here to write fantasy stories, well... First of all, what's that like? Either way, doesn't matter, because as it turns out, they accidentally strike right at the heart of the creativity shard itself. But not the first one, that's mostly just about magic, so we'll start with the second. Wait, what's what's my Brandon Sanderson impression? Let's 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 look up a few YouTube videos, I'll be back. Hello, I'm famous YouTuber Brandon Sanderson. And what your magic can't do is more important than what it can. This basically illustrates something that might not quite make sense at first. Limitations are essential to creativity. Oh what the fuck, right? Putting limits on what you're allowed to think about sure seems like it may coming up with ideas a whole lot harder. Like, if cool ideas were procedurally generated veins of iron ore, you'd find a whole lot less of them in one chunk than you would in the vast infinity of the Minecraft world. That's just basic math and statistical probability, but fuck your math, because there are actually an infinite amount of ideas to be had, and it doesn't mean jack shit to divide infinity. Ideas aren't Minecraft blocks. Nah, I know ideas at this point, and they're these little jackrabbit cheetah seals smothered with a gallon of oil and set loose in a boundless grassland. If you don't build some fences to corner those little fucks, your human ass ain't catching none of them. <clears throat> to put it another way, welcome to the void of possibility. Right now, you could create anything. The reason it's represented by a blank screen is not that I hate editing with a blinding passion and will jump on any chance to avoid it, it's that there's too much here for your mind to comprehend. Because you can imagine literally anything and that's overwhelming, your mind will immediately latch onto familiar things, the easiest answers, because it needs to start somewhere. Which is how you get Barry Frogger and the 80th Samey Magic School I've seen this month. When you ask someone for a random word, a good half the time it's something in their immediate field of vision. It's the same principle. Working without limitation doesn't usually work. You'll just run into the limits provided by everything you've read and watched and experienced up to this point, and the stuff you come up with will end up looking exactly like it. You think you're being creative until you realize you've just reinvented Homestuck for the 413th time. Most idea comer upper withs find this unsatisfying, and it can lead to stretches of never feeling original with the ideas you're coming up with. So the trick with setting limits, even if they're completely random limits, is that you get to break free of that simply because you weren't thinking like everyone else who had ideas before you. In fact, I think this might be why little kids seem so creative to us. 
By the time you're 15, you've been exposed to enough of the world and society that you get the gist of the big old fiction that I'm gonna call reality, even if you don't see all the little details. But a four-year-old has experienced such a small slice of stuff that it's bound to be a terrible sample size. If they've heard 10 songs and three of them were by the butthole surfers, then the butthole surfers are what a third of all music is to them. They're gonna come up with shit you've never seen before because when they're making something, they don't have access to all the shit you do and they don't measure it in the same proportions. If you have to stop eating candy, put the candy in the next room over and toss a blanket over it for good measure. And if you don't want to write Tolkien again, put the Tolkien shit in the other room and close the door. Recreate those limits artificially. Become one with the four-year-old. Of course, what that means is gonna depend entirely on what kind of creative you wanna be. If you wanna come up with cooler compositions and better things to draw following something like Inktober, where you get a prompt every day, might just be your jam. If you wanna write short stories, Doof Media's Do The Right Thing is a weekly podcast that does a similar sort of style, giving you three words and a time limit to kick off a short story with. And if your desired creative output happens to be <clears throat> unique and intriguing fantasy settings, then maybe invest a little bit of time in map making so you've got a concrete somewhere to cultivate your something. But if you just want to get the juices flowing in the first place, get some basic practice in, then you've come to the right video. Now we can start thinking about the first of our exercises. If originality is just taking not original ideas and putting them together, or taking one idea and changing its context in a way we don't expect, well guess what the purest, simplest form of that is? I'll give you a hint. I've been doing it this whole video. If you guessed wasting your time, ouch. If you guessed being pretty, well hello there. <laughs> And if you guess making a fool out of yourself, you're absolutely right! It's comedy! <laughs> Broadly, jokes are funny because they're unexpected. Because you see idea A, and then you see idea Nokia 3310, and you go, hey, those two don't go together. And if you've heard a joke before, you probably won't find it as funny. Unless you're my friend who consistently laughs at people saying, bees, Jigger. Did I get ya? In any case, what I was saying, bees, Jigger. Huh? I'm just kidding, none of my friends watch my videos. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, that's right, teaching you how to be funny. <laughs> For this riveting exercise, take a blank sheet of paper and write your name at the top of it. Nope, not write your name, that's, that's elementary school. Write a question at the top of it. This is going to be your limit. It's gotta be open-ended enough that there can be multiple answers, but still be pretty particular. Pause quick for some examples. Now write down every answer to the question you can think of and don't repeat yourself. Some people will tell you that there are no bad ideas. That is bullshit. You will find plenty. You still gotta write them all down anyways. The first few will be shit that everyone thinks of. You should run into some very obvious and not very funny answers very quickly. So just get it out of your system, get them down and done with so you can start getting to the good shit. Your greatest enemy is the friends you made along the way. No, no, that's not even a little bit correct. Your greatest enemy is yourself, specifically perfectionism. If every pork chop were perfect, we wouldn't have hot dogs, so make like capitalism and just constantly produce things that are going to go to waste. If you can forgive your local supermarket for not bothering to disclose their food waste amounts to reference specifically in a video or so that anyone could hold them accountable for their actions, you can sure as hell forgive yourself. Just remember, you never have to show this to people, nobody but you ever has to know that you said, well, that. Unless you have the brilliant idea to write a video demonstrating the concept, in which case, uh, you're fucked. No, that's way too generic. In which case, the facade is broken and they know you're an idiot now. Did anybody think I wasn't an idiot before, is the question. In which case, the jig is up and you forfeit your right to be funny forevermore. Well, I could do a bit about being arrested for not being funny. Nah, no, that's just stupid. Oh, but I can meet my cellmate and we see it's Ben Shapiro. Nah, there's gotta be someone less funny. I can't take every excuse to dunk on Ben. He's just got such a punchable face, you know? A face that only a profoundly self-closeted gay guy who projects his insecurities onto rampant homophobia instead of accepting himself could love. Oh, so now you can be funny. Where were you when we were writing the line in the first place? In which case, you'll show everyone what charming idiot looks like without the charm. Oh gods, now I'm just depressing myself. See? Isn't comedic workshopping fun? If you're having trouble thinking of even obvious ideas, it's probably a sign that the void of possibility is still too big. Try specifying the question a little. Instead of, so how are my chances? Try, so how are my chances, doc? It immediately points you in a direction, doesn't it? But once you have something with even one or two obvious ways to take it, get cracking, write down everything. There are zero consequences, you can set the page on fire afterwards. Because here's the thing about the list you end up with. If you do this with a hundred of your friends, you are a very popular person, good gods. But you'll also start to see a trend. The stuff at the top of the list is stuff that like 15 other people came up with. 
Depending on the question, maybe even 50 people have something very similar to your number one answer somewhere on their list. But the stuff at the bottom? Well, once you've run through all the obvious, you're hitting stuff that's all you, that only you could have come up with. And it's probably a lot funnier than the stuff at the top too, because we aren't expecting it. Welcome to being creative. Don't worry, it gets easier the more you do it. By the time you've hit answer 29, you've run through a half a dozen ways to reinterpret that collection of words. You're not thinking of what you can do within the limits, but what those limits can do for you. What's the weirdest thing they do allow? And what could you only do with that setup? They stop becoming limits and start becoming features when you start building things around them. For example, my co-dungeon master and I decided one day that we wanted our campaign setting to be on the inside of a hollow sphere, with the sun in the center of it. Because among the various limits I place on my own creativity to keep myself from falling to the desolation of Winter Court is that nothing can ever be simple or easy, can it? So we see the limits right away. Our mythical gunslinger warlock can't ride off into the sunset unless she has some kind of pegasus or flying broom, because the transition from day to night always happens right above this spittoon she most recently donned as a hat. From there, you can sketch out your map, consult your local physics major about the effect of the central sun's repellent gravity, and start to story spinning. Now with this set of limits, we needed seasons, right? So I proposed that orbiting the central sun, there would be several lanterns. One which channeled the heat, another which channeled a lot of condensation and storms, one that caused the tides, and so on and so forth. In figuring out their orbits, we would essentially create new patterns of season, new interactions for the people of the sphere to deal with, build their technology around, and keep track of. Having a radial effect like that reaching so much of the surface area isn't something you could do with a regular old exospherical cosmology. It's something only possible with all these limitations. So of course, we swiftly implemented these ideas, causing still newer limits that would then shape the world building of every culture on the surface, creating a realm never before seen, running the greatest D&D campaign known to mankind and going down the history books. We definitely didn't veto that in favor of just offsetting the planet's orbit around the central sun, creating a fairly normal seasonal pattern across the board. In all seriousness, we did use those limits to come up with some pretty cool shit, but on the off chance that any of our players watch this video, they're gonna get the coolest knickknacks from the junkyard, not the final prototype. But even with the tragic loss of my 16 season system, delving in deep to figure out what worked and what didn't work in this cosmology, different cultural norms that could arise, and so on, was quite the rewarding experience. Everything from religions to idioms changes, and suddenly dozens of new ideas are coming up over that horizon that doesn't fucking exist because the inside of a sphere doesn't have those. If you want me to do a whole video on creativity and world building, hit me up, leave a comment. I have in fact done entire videos because a single person told me to. Also, if you're commenting at all, you're like 20% of my entire comment section. I'm at your whim, dude. Okay, we've conquered the second Sanderson Law, time for the third! Expand on what you have already before you add something new. In a magic system, this might be like, think of all the ways you can use a particular ability and how it's integrated into the world before you add more shit. To give an example I just thought of in the shower, what if the only spell in Harry Potter was Accio? Or what if every spell was some flavor of Accio? Well then you might see a very deadly wizard whose MO is to throw a pellet, geometrically position themselves, and then summon it through the head of one of their victims. Avada Kedavra that, motherfuckers. That's a more unique magical style than we get to see throughout like any of the books. I mean, characters almost don't have specific spellcasting styles in the books. And before you ask, spamming the Expelliarmus button does not fucking count. At the end of the day, it's still about that limitation. The less ideas you're working with, the more creative you have to be to create contrast, and thus the more fleshed out everything gets. Think about the comedy exercise. If you add a new question every minute, all you get for each one are the first four answers, the least interesting parts of the lists. The thing about ideas that a lot of kids have is, well, like the answers to our first exercise, they're cool and they're different, but they're a little bit flat. There's not a whole lot of exploration or integration of the ideas, and they come up with a new one every minute. Or maybe that's just all the ADHD people I hang out with. So while this random kid's individual ideas might be really freaking cool, if you ask them to build a whole fantasy world, you'll get an inconsistent mess that bears a suspicious similarity to Fablehaven. To practice the fleshing stuff out part, take that page from earlier, the one you hopefully didn't really set on fire in a ritual sacrifice to appease the muses, and give your favorite answers like a little star or highlight or some other symbol of approval. If your self-esteem is a certified card-carrying bitch, ask a friend to select their favorites. This will involve showing people it's for a good cause. If your friends don't have any favorites, then I doubt that's helping your self-esteem issues and you should probably get better friends. Anyhow, get that list together one way or another. Now start from the top, roll a d6, hop to the number rolled like you're playing Monopoly, and then expand whatever you land on into a whole scene. You have a question and answer, so continue that conversation. Describe context, think of a follow-up to that, think of the kinds of characters who would say that kind of thing. Now you're cooking with environmentally friendly nuclear power, you're building off of the most creative and outside of the box thing, or possibly the fifth most creative thing, which is already not the box. 
And if you expand it and you do everything I said and you're still not satisfied with what you come up with, maybe they're too generic or archetypical. Well, just remember that the first stuff you think of is always towards the top of that list. Stuff that everyone else who likes your top 10 anime is also going to come up with. Tinker around with them, work off of what you have and even off of what you just know. And no, I don't mean steal Hermione Granger and put her in cyberpunk. Just the opposite, in fact. When I'm trying to create a character to fill a certain role, there's usually something that jumps to mind immediately, and it's usually flat out stolen from somewhere. Or even if it isn't, as I write them, I'll start to fall into tropes I recognize. My charming road starts to look like Kelsier or Constantine, because mimicry is easy and originality is hard. So what I do to prevent that from happening is when a character gets to that state of development, I write down every character that feels vaguely similar to this one and then write an intentional contrast to each of them. If I'm feeling really like a person who has a lot of time, I'll write the characters into a dialogue or figure out what their comedy duo would look like. Because again, humor is a great dowsing wad for contrast. Dowsing wad? Hey, I'm Dowswad. I'm a goblin. If they're too similar, change their attitude, their worldview, their mindset, their gender, their idea of gender, their surroundings. Change the things about them that you understand best, and the rest will naturally adjust. If you're a really visual person, change their color scheme or design. Give them a bulkier coat or something. If you like doing wacky voices like some of us do, well, maybe give them a different cadence or pitch. Staccato or legato, their dialogue. And remember to keep working off of what you already have. When you're making those decisions, work in relation to the other characters you've already made. But no, this does not mean make everybody secretly your main character's father. I do this kind of shit until I feel like the character is fleshed out enough to be their own thing, and then I can start applying loads of writing advice from this can of worms that this video is already way too close to opening. The point is, it gets easier. I still do this entire contrast panorama extravaganza on occasion, especially if I'm stuck or it's an off day, but by and large when I make my characters, this process occurs automatically in my head. I'm coming up with twists to put on things like their excuses for not doing my homework the third time this week, which makes an excellent exercise A now that I'm thinking about it. My point is, the more you learn about how you think and get used to shake and loose those mind muscles so that they can be harvested by the passing sailboat that is your consciousness, the shorter the top flops of your list will be, and the quicker you'll start getting to stuff that you can feel proud of. Well, assuming that you can still feel things after 2020. You get the gist. And for one final tip, completely antithetically to my first one, go out and experience shit, fucko! Experience as much shit as you can, preferably weird shit. Learn what an axolotl is. Do you know what an axolotl is? If you do, then look up more weird creatures. Learn about obscure mythology, about biology and oceanography and stoichiometry, and I won't force you to learn about stoichiometry, it's mostly a pain in the ass. Being creative is nice synonymous with thinking outside of the box. The limits we set up are like scaffolding from inside that we can bring with us so we don't plummet into the abyss of saying, fuck writing, I'm gonna spend four hours on TikTok. It's all flimsy and flat and basically monkey bars for big people. Also, it doesn't look that much like a building. You gotta have the tools to fill it in, flush it out, give it depth, and let that depth cultivate new ideas. And you're gonna need that grist from somewhere. It could be from the nature documentary you just watched, or your anthropology class, or uh, whatever you saw that one time you did acid. Clarifying, don't don't do acid, uh, unless you want to. I I've never done acid. If I didn't know how seasons worked, I could have spared my co-DM all that lantern bullshit. And we can't have that. If I hadn't talked to so many people about their worldviews, then the only worldviews I'd write into my characters would be from shit that I read or watched. Creating new things is about combining them in new surprising ways. We create the new part by blocking ourselves off from the way we usually combine things, but ultimately, the more things we have to combine before we start setting our limits, the better and weirder you'll be able to get. Unfortunately, none of these tips will actually make you get off your ass and pursue creativity, or get you to look at the goddamn list and come up with shit instead of scrolling through TikTok for an hour. Nor how to find time or energy in the capitalist hellscape to pursue your passions. If I knew those secrets, well then you probably would have gotten this video, like, two months ago. Like I said at the start, this is the grind low-level kobolds for XP method. If you want a faster one, then, well, you gotta find your own, because it's probably gonna be unique to you. This is also totally not the only method. It's kinda just where I decided to take these principles, probably because my main creative outputs are all humor-based. If this whole thing ain't your thing, well then, uh, why are you still here? No, um, then I'm sure you can find yourself a different prompt. Just make sure you still have all those limitations. Creativity is a wide open expanse. Thinking of ways to solve a problem is creative. Character building is creative. Wacky voices are creative. And D&D is just a combination of those three things. The world is boundless, yours to shape. But like, not, not too boundless. Gotta keep all those Tasmanian dolphin hyenas hemmed in somehow. 
I'm Jay, and may my maniacal methods multiply thy mysticism a millionfold. I'll see you next time.